Welcome everyone to Floor Tree Academy. This is our last night tonight for this session of Floor Tree Academy. Um, this program was made possible by a grant from Lift Every Voice. Lift Every Voice is presented by Library of America in partnership with the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture and funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation and the Emerson Collective with additional partnerships from Ball State University's Office of Diversity and Inclusive Excellence. Along with this program, I would like to recommend this book to you called African American Poetry, 250 Years of Struggle and Song. This is a Library of America anthology by Dr. Excuse me, not Dr. Just by Kevin Young. Um, with that being said, we also, I don't want to forget that we have our, um, our, um, excuse me, <laughs> our, Jesus. Eric, uh, Richard, help me. What's it called? Por poetry Slam. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> poetry Slam, it wouldn't come. Um, our Poetry Slam slash, slash uh, talent showcase. Okay. Um, for anyone to attend to join if they would like to. I have in my hand with me, I have four $25 gift cards for the winners of those pro that program. Um, just let us know, Richard my, or I, if you would like to sign up for the program, we would like you to um, join. Um, as I mentioned, my name is Tanisha Harris. I'm one of the organizers of this program. I'm also the supervisor of the Connection Corner Branch Library here in Muncie. Um, another one of our, pro, um, our organizers is Richard Bowman. He's a Ball State University grad student. Um, he has a great love of poetry and he will give us our rules and he will um, get us started and introduce our speaker tonight. Richard, take it away. Hello, hello. Uh Thank you all for coming to, you know, another workshop, our final workshop today. Um, you know, just before we really get into it, just going into our general guidelines for the space. Um, once again, first and foremost, of course, this is a space of understanding. You know, we come in here and we look to understand, to learn, to, you know, gain perspective, to see things differently. And that's the mindset we should come into this with. And this is also a space of respect. That's just the number one thing. Now today is very special, of course, because we have another guest poet for you guys. And this individual is, I mean, they're all incredibly talented, but this individual is somewhat special. Um, he stood out to me when I first heard him do just a freestyle poem right off the cuff and like, he is, he, he walks the walk, he talks the talk, and I'm going to just leave it at that. You know, what he has to teach you, he is a master of in his own right. So, without further ado, Eric Saunders, yeah. I look, I don't know if they're clapping behind their names right now, <laughs> or whatever. Yeah, I can at least put like a little clap sign if, you, if you're there. Like, I'm a, I'm a teacher, so here we go. <laughs> Here we go. Thank you, Stuart. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Some applause for him. So my name is Mr. Saunders, and I'm two generations from the plantation. And I say that because I recently lost my pops, um, sadly, to uh, violence here in the, um, in the city. And But I, when I was listening to old videos, uh, uh, audios that we had, because me and him, we were freestyle back and forth. And that was how we communicated uh, to one another. It was unrehearsed, it was unrestricted, it was just how we conversed. It was uh, essentially pouring from the heart and just bringing it together and molding it. So when I started off, I'm two generations from the plantation because August 18, 2016, I once was down in the basement hanging out with friends and I recorded our conversation and I passed and I, and I said, Father, and he began, that was how he came in, but he said, I'm one generation from the plantation. And he said, then he ended that freestyle ultimately saying, he said, the seed, the sun, the sea, my son smile upon his face. And that's my contribution to this human race. And so 
Uh, as I begin to go forward, I just wanted to, again, make sure um, I say, Barry Ghani, you know, today's purpose is, uh, you know, today's principle is near. So that's just something I really want to um, encompass today. Um, yeah, thank you guys for coming. I wanted to talk to you guys a little bit more about the whole uh, free verse, freestyle, um, and just the whole, very, uh, the couple of combinations and how it may vary. And this should be fun. This should be different because what I like to tend to do is put things in context. Um, and I think that's very important because a lot of times people think that they're doing something new. And it's easy to do that if you don't really have context. And so when we begin to talk about free verse, you know, even as I talk about freestyle, when I was first talking about it, again, I was in the impression that you connect hip hop or rapping to the 70s, 80s, 60s, Brooklyn, East Coast kind of thing. Now this goes back further <laughs> than that in terms of the rhetorical process and, and, and putting it together and encompassing your pain and the rhythm and the flow and just the regular prose of it all. And so um, I'll go ahead and get the presentation started and go have fun. Any questions start off? All right, all right, no, all right. Can, may I have, uh, let me see. Do I still have sharing capabilities to the host? You should. Okay, hold tight then. Yeah. All right, so here we go. Um, so when it comes to poetry, um, initially again, in introduced uh, by um, a gentleman that we all know, um, mostly heard of through the Harlem Renaissance, Langston Hughes, um, paternity brother of mine. So I just wanted to give him a little shout out because he, it was his per per poetry that verse really kind of reached out to me because again, a lot of it did not rhyme. And it was just telling us a story. It was telling a testimony. All right, come on. All right, give me just a second. Hold on. <laughs> Didn't mean to go that far up. I this is that Zoom life where you just kind of have to be on your Teddy Riley mode all the time. But I'll just go ahead and start it off with uh, I too sing America. I am the darker brother. They send me to eat at the kitchen in the kitchen when company comes, but I laugh and eat well and grow strong. Tomorrow, I'll be at the table when company comes. Nobody would dare say to me, eat in the kitchen then. Besides, they'll see how beautiful I am and be ashamed. I too am American. And so what I had gathered from that poem is again a lot of times like i said before with free verse and the freestyle you're going right off the cuff of your heart and it just pours out and so a lot of times again where you're experiencing immense pain that i i have i have no place for it to be restricted i just needed to come out and i needed to come out bare okay and as this poem, this kind of I too sing America, as he's speaking during the times of the Harlem Renaissance, uh, a lot of times what we know about the 30s is the Great Depression. We don't know the ins and outs and how a lot of things move, because that's not often covered. And so we rely on those poets, such as Langston Hughes, uh, to really kind of in, 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 to show us through poetry what was going on. And it's, and it's like in real time. I, now, as, as I've grown as a poet, I can actually, you know, just kind of go back and say, he just sat down and did this and wrote exactly what he saw and what he felt. One of the beautiful things about technology these days is it's cool hearing it from me and reading it, but I love, I love, love going back and hearing it from, you know, trying to find out old audio to where we can actually hear the poet speak. I too sing America. I am the darker brother. They send me to eat in the kitchen when company comes, but I laugh and eat well and grow strong. Tomorrow, I'll be at the table when company comes. Nobody will dare say to me, eat in the kitchen then. Besides, they'll see how beautiful we are and be ashamed. 
I too am America. Hard in the. I too sing America. I am the darker brother. Interesting tone. The words essentially say it all. You know, a lot of times, again, in, in modern day with free verse, you, you hear a lot of fluctuation and the voice will really kind of, you know, capture the emotion. Again, that was just pretty basic, um, just being read. But it, at that time, the words said it all and the experience said it all. There wasn't a much need for um, uh, such emphasis other than just to read it and read it intelligently and read it to be heard. So I digged a little bit deeper <laughs> and I wanted to just kind of get this idea of this thing called free verse. All right. And so one of the places that it was originally kind of pointed to was back to France. Um, so I just, yeah, so free verse, open form of poetry, uh, as modern form rolls through the French uh, mirrors libre form, does not use consistent meter, meter patterns, rhyme or any musical uh, pattern. Not to say that I won't, it's just, again, I'm just reading what this is. It thus tends to follow the rhythm of natural speech. Verse libre is a free verse poetic form of flexibility, complexity, and naturalness created in the late 19th century in France in 1886. Um, unrestrained by traditional boundaries, the poet possesses more license to express and has more control over the development of the poem. And this can all uh, this can allow for more spontaneous and individual individualized poetic art and product. So, guys, truth be told, um, I don't know if you guys are old enough to understand this whole conehead reference right here. Uh, just we come from France, so <laughs> I think that was just to be corny. Um, but for me, initially, as it speaks to that unrestrained by traditional boundaries, what really kind of caught my attention to the spoken word in connection to this free verse is <clears throat> my early days of going to church. And by the time I was 10, knew the difference between a Catholic church and a Methodist church. Okay. The Catholic church, let's look at it like this. And I didn't make a, but it seemed like you got to follow the rules. You got to follow the, you got to read it this way. You got to say the prayer this way. You got to do it in, in those. You go into the Methodist church, you got a little bit more leverage to, who holler to, to, to be more expressive of yourself. And so when I was about nine or 10, I'll never just forget, you know, again, going to church and, and this, the whole, <laughs> and, you know, and father, and, and then, and then watching how more so the people responded to it and, and the in-between for that to, for that, you know, person to convict somebody on the inside uh, just with, you know, with the words, so it was like they was moving them. And so that performance, um, in a sense, has never left me. And a lot of times, again, the, the preacher was not walking around with a piece of paper reading it. He was just telling you how he felt. All right. And so, I, you know, I, 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 I like that. <laughs> I really enjoy seeing that. And um and, and I, I try to make sure that when I speak to people that is with a sense of conviction, you know, because we never know where that conversation goes. So here's a list a little bit. Um, I don't know if everybody can see, you might want to move this little sidebar here. All right, I'm gonna pull it down. Sorry, cause I know this is being recorded. All right, so a couple of forms about the structure of free verse. Uh, so again, here's a tip. Uh, the rhythm is organic. Okay, it's again, it's a natural flow. Uh, there's no strict emphasis on meter or structure. Um, another tip, all syllables are important and unrestricted. So even though, um, so even though I'm essentially trying to, I might throw a rhyme in there, but I'm not going A, B, A, B, A, B, A, B. You know, I'm not going, you know, meter. I'm not trying to, you know, uh, this rhyme, I might mix it up a little bit. And even still, I might not repeat that rhyme pattern uh, throughout the poem. I could throw it in there. I could take it out. Um, and so it's, it's, it becomes a very interesting play on words. So I put it structured. Uh, it's still value. Um, you can ask Walt Whitman, um, and I'll show you. Um, I was just kind of reading one of his free verse where he can tend to maybe use repetition um, and at times use, you know, meter. Uh, but, again, he, he can go in and out of that. And he's kind of coined as... 
uh, the first American poet to, you know, really use free verse. Um, then last tip, uh, elevation of emotion and conviction. Um, it's, the, it's the prose of life that makes it feel relatable, uh, such as Sabrina Benam, Benam reciting, explaining my depression to my mother. So we'll hear uh, uh, from both of them in, in the slides coming up next. This is old Walt Whitman. And, <laughs> and so essentially, guys, man, like I said, I, I, I started off on the scene, African-American uh, poetry, um, longest running uh, open mic in Indianapolis, Cafe Kumba. Uh, Kumba is a Kwanzaa principal, so you know it's mostly black folks there. <laughs> but man, that was just such a great, it's been such a great experience for me. However, I had got to the point where I just said to myself, um, Yes, I remember in middle school, I, I, you know, we had our Harlem Renaissance period, but I remember Whitman name and I, re, I remember um, uh, all these other poets name. And I said, well, let me give them a ch just a chance as a poet, not as a black poet, but as a poet and actually hear what they was talking about and making reference to in their time because they're still legends in their own right. And so let me at least learn from them. And um, so here's one of the um, pieces from Walt Whitman and written in free verse. Uh, entitled Leaves of Grass. From Leaves of Grass by Walt Whitman. A child said, what is grass? Fetching it to me with full hands. How could I answer the child? I do not know what it is any more than he. I guess it must be the flag of my disposition, out of hopeful green stuff woven. Or I guess it is the handkerchief of the Lord, a scented gift in remembrance, sir, designedly dropped, bearing the owner's name somewhere in the corners that we may see and remark and say, whose? Or I guess the grass is itself a child, the produced babe of the vegetation. Or I guess it is a uniform hieroglyphic, and it means sprouting alike in broad zones and narrow zones, growing among black folks as among white. Canuck, Tuka, oh, Congressman Cuff, I give them the same, I receive them the same. And now it seems to me the beautiful uncut hair of graves. Tenderly will I use you curling grass. It may be you transpire from the breasts of young men. It may be if I had known them, I would have loved them. It may be you are from old people or from offspring taken soon out of their mother's laps. And here you are, the mother's laps. This grass is very dark to be from the white heads of old mothers, darker than the colorless beards of old men, dark to come from under the faint red roofs of mouths. Who oh, I perceive, after all, so many uttering tongues, and I perceive that they do not come from the roofs of mouths for nothing. I wish I could translate the hints about the dead young men and women, and the hints about old men and mothers, and the offspring taken too soon out of their laps. What do you think have become of the young and old men? What do you think have become of the women and children? They are alive and well somewhere. The smallest sprout shows that there is really no death. And if ever there was, it led forward life, and it does not wait at the end to arrest it, and ceased the moment life appeared. All goes onward and outward, nothing collapses, and to die is different from what anyone supposed, and luckier. I believe a leaf of grass is no less than a journey work of the stars. I think I could turn and live with animals. They are so placid and self-contained. I stand and look at them long and long. They do not sweat and whine about their condition. They do not lie awake in the dark and weep for their sins. They do not make me sick discussing their duty to God. Not one is dissatisfied. Not one is demented with the mania of owning things. Not one kneels to another, nor to his kind that lived thousands of years ago. Not one 
is respectable or unhappy over the earth. All right. Now, before I go on to the next piece, can I just get some feedback on uh, some things that you might have noticed um, about uh, the presentation of that poem? The wording, uh, value, what, what, what were your thoughts? Oh, Zoom life. <laughs> The, uh, the tone to me was just a steady tone. It didn't fluctuate or anything. It just stayed at an even keel. And, and, and I think with, in doing so, and then for us in this situation, us being able to read the words and hear the words, is just kind of like, again, I'm literally able to look into his world and pull out of so many parallels to 2020 if anything he was saying yo it's crazy back here and, and so like that's a very relatable poem because like walt it's very crazy in 2020 and i would have loved to i would have loved to see what a walt whitman writes about in 2020 knowing that he wrote something like that just to kind of explain the environment just as plain as day straight off the cuff straight off of the heart and again that was telling of his culture and so I bring up the culture because essentially, um, even just kind of going back to France, that uh, one of the things I kind of left out was that there was a band of poets, of French poets, that were essentially is going around expressing and telling of the culture through this form, and which deferred from what was normal, which was again that that rhyme that rhyming pattern. But what I one thing I've noticed is just how much this free verse has allowed us to express ourselves in a way um, for the culture. One of the things I'm noticing now is that there are a lot more commercials with poems. Uh, the American, I believe the American got, has talent winner was a poet, you know? And so I'm starting to see um, in, 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 rele in relevant in terms of communication during a time where it seems like people are lost in um, communication if that makes sense. And so um, just to know that that's still the value in terms of um, being able to, again, communicate what needs to be communicated, to communicate what might often be missed, you know, because we're so used to going, you know, this, you know, uh, going in this lane, um, some would say being stuck in the matrix, you know, and it's great that a poet that says, I just need to pull you out with these words, with these thoughts and these expressions um, so, that, that, so that what I'm going through and that what other people are going through, it, it actually means something. Uh, so I feel like poets have always kind of stood, especially with this form, um, has been used a lot just to say, I need, I have to say it right now. I don't have time to edit it. I don't have time to break it down. I have time to write it, get it out, fill it and give it to you right now because of the, of the urgency of it all. And I say that to say, um, it's been several times where I've, I've been playing, I play basketball. I haven't played, of course, in a year, but I'll go to the, the local basketball courts and sometimes there'll be teenagers around. And a couple of times, one time, a young girl was calling another girl uh, B word. It just, it was just, it just constant custom. And I just, I just busted out in poem. I literally in the middle of a basketball court, I'm busting out a point when I'm like, they think I'm just probably this drunk OG <laughs> or something like that. But when I began to relate to him, it's just like everybody stood still and, and, let, and let me speak to them with that conviction. And um, so, you know, so again, it's just, it's, it's there to stress a whole different kind of urgency. So when I say that, um, Leaves of Grass by Walt Whitman. Okay, Walt, you had your chance. Moving on. Child's okay. So I ran into um, another poem that's more of, of our era, uh, Button Poetry. I love Button Poetry. Um, and this young lady, you can see it in the title, Explaining My Depression to My Mother. And during this time of 2020, <laughs> I call it the year of the butterfly effect. Um, I, I honestly believe depression is an all-time high. And the sad thing about it is 
you think about how long have people gone with having depression and feeling like, A, they can't communicate to the people that they supposed to love the most. A, I can't communicate to my friends. I don't really even know what's happening. So a lot of times you might hear about depression, it's after the fact that something might have drastically happened. And we're, you know, yes, we're talking about suicide. Yes, we're talking about, uh, you know, whatever you have to do. Um, and so again, now you have so many poets that are going straight at the issue. I, I, I don't have any time. I'm not gonna roses are red, violets are blue you. If anything, I might incorporate that into this free verse po poem for a sense of emphasis or for a sense of creativity because you have that liberation to do so. Uh, this poem here, um, this is a great poem just about depression. It reminds me of a poem I did called Many Men um, that talked about sexual molestation. And it was a, this is a free verse poem. Um, sexual molestation, essentially children who are molested by their parents. It was not my story, but it was another person's story in which I had, you know, I knew I worked with people in, in the case management setting. And I was just like, but just to even take my mind into that mold of that, you know, that child is to even imagine. It's a, it's a, it's a dark place. And, um, but again, it, it's an urgency. And so I think with this poem here, um, really stresses the urgency and it differs from Walt Whitman again a different time different venues different so on and so forth um and that wasn't Walt Whitman by the way that was actually reading that particular poem but I had like, I got to go find one of his book I think I have one of him reading a poem though um but this young lady again uh, with, the, with the title of um, explaining my depression to my mother really speaks to a lot of things in which we're dealing with uh, today, you'll notice a different uh, tone fluctuation, and but again, it's still responding to the culture. It's responding to the culture immediately, and and it's coming straight from the heart. Check it out. Explaining my depression to my mother, a conversation. Mom, my depression is a shapeshifter. One day it is as small as a firefly in the palm of a bear. The next, it's the bear. On those days, I play dead until the bear leaves me alone. I call the bad days the dark days. Mom says, try lighting candles. When I see a candle, I see the flesh of a church, the flicker of a flame, sparks of a memory younger than noon. I am standing beside her open casket. It is the moment I learn every person I ever come to know will someday die. Besides, Mom, I'm not afraid of the dark. Perhaps that's part of the problem. Mom says, I thought the problem was that you can't get out of bed. I can't. Anxiety holds me a hostage inside of my house, inside of my head. Mom says, where did anxiety come from? Anxiety is the cousin visiting from out of town. Depression felt obligated to bring to the party. Mom, I am the party. Only I am a party I don't want to be at. Mom says, why don't you try going to actual parties? See your friends. Sure. I make plans. I make plans, but I don't want to go. I make plans because I know I should want to go. I know sometimes I would have wanted to go. It's just not that much fun having fun when you don't want to have fun, Mom. <sighs> you see, Mom, each night, insomnia sweeps me up in his arms, dips me in the kitchen in the small glow of the stove light. Insomnia has this romantic way of making the moon feel like perfect company. Mom says, try counting sheep. But my mind can only count reasons to stay awake, so I go for walks. But my stuttering kneecaps clank like silver spoons held in strong arms with loose wrists. They ring in my ears like clumsy church bells, reminding me I am sleepwalking on an ocean of happiness I cannot baptize myself in. Mom says happy is a decision, but my happy is as hollow as a pinpricked egg. My happy is a high fever that will break. Mom says I am so good. I'm making something out of nothing and then flat out asks me if I am afraid of dying. No, I am afraid of living. Mom, I am lonely. I think I learned the, how when dad left, how to turn the anger into lonely, the lonely into busy. So when I tell you I've been super busy lately, I mean, I've been falling asleep watching SportsCenter on 
<laughs> okay, let me get you guys feedback. What did that trigger something that pertains to you or somebody that you know? Can you relate? I'm seeing. I feel like I can definitely relate. I've actually read her whole entire book, uh, which is amazing. Um, but mm -hmm. I loved it. <clears throat> I loved that poem and I loved her book. And it's just, I don't know, it's weird to think that, um, like, the difference between um, the generational gap and the understanding of mental um, illness or, like, the willingness to believe in mental illness. Um, is it's I don't know it's something that I've definitely found in my personal life so to hear someone else say it is just so incredible and, and you know the interesting thing about that um that poem is playing Walt Whitman first and then going there he's talking about I, I just look at the animals and see how they don't bicker and essentially fool with the same thing that we that we are fooling with and so then you fast forward all this, you know, this way down, again, it's like, man, he is essentially talking about something now. He was able to see something now into where you have poets today. I mean, again, as a poet, I'm, I'm listening to that. I was like, that is that woman's story. That's for real. <laughs> you know, they, cause you, I, and, 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 um, Richard, I'm glad you said I saw it on another segment and it's the truth. And I think that's for everybody to know. Um, you write about what you know. And if you don't know it, you, you, you know, you learn it, you know, you, you, you expose yourself, you become vulnerable um, um, to it. <clears throat> and so, yeah, like I said, that, that I just have sometimes I got to just listen to that because ultimately what she was able to do is kind of covers everything which I've kind of covered so far, even the, the, the ministering part. I take ministry, when I say that, it's not necessarily I'm somebody trying to you know, convert you to their, their, their belief, this, that, and the other uh, in, in a religious fashion, but I'm trying to minister you with, with my, from heart to heart that, that you understand that, you know, again, that's the power that I think she displayed so eloquently just with that free verse poem. Like, it's not, I'm, I'm trying to read your poem, I'm talking to you. So again, I'll, I'll continue to kind of emphasize that because uh, we got some time together and uh, yeah, all right. Okay. So my question to you guys, uh, before we, uh, you know, get rolling into kind of a different direction, do you see where free verse is of the culture for the culture? Does that make sense? <laughs> Essentially, do you see where a lot of times it's capturing something immediately kind of going on and, and bothering that poet? Do you see that poet, again, as a representation of the things of the culture that um, essentially are not discussed? As, as you said, and I see MT, is that cool? MT, is that what you want me to say? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Um, I think you kind of maybe even touched into that, um, the things that we don't want to talk about, the things that we want to uncover, I mean, I want to keep covered. So I just wanted to know if you guys were able to just kind of, you know, witness that and see that. Because now I'm about to make a hard left on you real quick. What do you mean by that? Have you guys ever heard of the dozens? You familiar with that? Okay. Because the last poem that we listened to, we talked about a person dealing with their depression. Right. So when we're talking about the, the, the dirty dozens, we're talking about essentially a, a, a depression of a whole culture of people, a trauma, a traumatization of a whole culture of people. But taking that trauma and using words and actually using it as a form of, of combat towards one another, as you can begin to see the pictures in the background, this is kind of we talk about your mama this, your mama that. You know, so again, that 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 goes back. So when I, as I'm pointing to this picture here, Dirty Dozen, again, we're we're talking before 1900 with something like this. Okay, we're talking about a, a culture again of people who um, essentially, because I'm in a traumatized state, I'm going to keep you traumatized, and so you begin to see those that now you hear the names, the Piccaninnies, and you hear shooting Uncle Toms, and you shoot the Coons, and, and, and the Sambo, and, 
and, and you know, just, you know, and far worse. And this is just the infighting. Okay, this no, I'm I'm just you know this is adults. I'm not talking about the N word. Okay, there are a lot of racial words internalized within black folks to, do, to where we we would constantly toss at each other, and kind of of that the dozens were born. Okay, so again, I just wanted to show a couple of uh, photos here that um, some might recognize. Again, that's barbershop. I believe barbershop two over here when they gave kind of gave a display of. Uh, the dozens. I did the dozens growing up as a kid. You had to. Um, I'm not that old, but 37 puts me in the late 1900s, uh, uh, <laughs> 1983. So in a time which we were still able to, where again, there was a lot of things that came in question. There's a lot of stuff coming in question now. So just imagine the 80s and 90s for real. Um, hey, I'm not even, you know, that young myself. <laughs> we was just talking. I just turned 22. I mean, I had to do it. I mean, it was kind of either you did it or you you were just kind of out. That was just it. Like it was, it was either you knew how to do this and you knew how to step up without getting your feelings hurt, or you know you were just kind of outcast. It was, you know, it was kind of like your proving ground. You know, at least that's what it felt like to me. Yeah, I have to excuse me. I had one of those daddy moments where. If I was growing up in the uh, 90s, it was a mommy moment where I have to go yell at my kids. <laughs> but that's, that's the real yeah, yeah, yeah. I love it. Um, but this is the tip. Uh, don't step up if you can't handle getting your feelings hurt. All right? <laughs> you know, so it was like if somebody say, hey. And again, back then, um, you know, I don't know, getting the age group back, you know, maybe it's still. All somebody had to say was your mama. It was like, your mama what? It's like, no, that's like, I mean, I see whole fights break off just off your mama because it was always implied that something's about to follow your mama. No, don't even put my mama's name in your mouth because we already know. So that, cause that's how the game was played for so long. But then you got to a culture of folks who are like, well, we're not playing the game anymore. But some people didn't know that. Some people do. And it kind of, again, weaved itself into how we communicate. Okay. And so, again, I want to just kind of emphasize that because, um, again, when you hear those your mama jokes, I mean, I want you to really see how far back that stems. You know, again, not a 60, 50 things. This is still, uh, you know, before 1900 in which these things have rooted and begin to, uh, uh, you know, uh, still impact us this day, to this day. So with that being said, who wants to play real quick? All right, come on, come on now, now. Put your cameras up. We gonna we gonna go ahead and have a your mama contest right now. Now I'm not gonna do that to you. I just put a video up so that you can watch it. But what I once did when I was uh, hosting a youth open mic uh, first Friday, um, with my good uh, friend Chantel Macy, um, we kind of flipped the script. And so I want you guys to hold on to this. So we instead of saying your mama is so fat, your mama is so stupid, your mama is so ghetto, your mama so this, that, and other. We was like, somebody can't, uh, some, we, we, we had a, we flipped it into a positive. So, uh, let me see. I want to like, say, I want to say, I'm, I'm a cracker, your mama joke, but it's, again, it's a positive. So any volunteers, can I, Rich, can I use you, man? Is it, I don't, okay. Hey man, your mama so fly, she got her own airplane. Your mama so fly, uh, she helped win the uh, vice president election by sitting on pencil. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So it's, it's, it's how do you now control the laughter and I don't have to demean you. I don't have to demean your mother because, again, we're talking about a time of culture to where that hate uh, and I'll just say, say what it is. That's, you know, just uh, a dislike, a strong hatred and dislike for one another because of the, the, the hatred and dislike for yourself, the insecurity coming out. So um, since nobody wants to play a Joni contest, you know, the, the dozen contest, I'm going to go ahead and give you a little snippet of what it kind of uh, was like. But I, I give a shout out to uh, Keena Ivory Waynes and Living Color just for being able to display this in the culture. Oh, 
This is Dirty Dozen. Now entering our studio, a video store clerk from Houston's Fifth Ward, Anthony Clark. A bicycle messenger from Uptown New York, T-Dawn Jenkins. And a housewife from Clearwater, Florida, Katie Corral. And now the host of Dirty Dozens, Stu Dunphy. Oh, thank you so much. Hello and welcome to the Dirty Dozens, where talking trash can get you cash. So if you listen, you'll hear some dissing. <laughs> All righty, let's look at our categories. Your mom is so stupid. <laughs> Your mom is so fat. <laughs> Your mom is so old. And potluck. T-Dog, start us off. I'll take your mama so stupid uh, for a hundred, Stu. All righty. Your mama's so stupid. <coughs> your mama's so stupid, she jumped out the window and the hole went up. Yes, T-Dog gets a hundred. So let's reveal the first piece of tonight's mystery kiss. <laughs> Gotta take a guess, T-Dog. Uh, your mama's so fat... Uh, they had to baptize it at SeaWorld. <laughs> <laughs> nice diss, but no. You still have control of the board, T-Dog. I think I will. Stick with stupid, Stu. And stupid you get. <laughs> your mama's so stupid. Uh, yeah, your mama's so stupid, it takes her two hours to watch 60 Minutes. Correct. <laughs> Anthony in the house with 200. Anthony, what will it be? Uh, stupid for 300. Okay. Your mama's so stupid. Your mother's so stupid, she scored below average on a recent IQ test. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Anybody? Yeah, uh, your mama's so stupid, she asked for a price check at the 99 cent store. Yes. Now that's one stupid mama. I will spare you guys the rest of this, uh, just for the sake of time. But again, look it up, Dirty Dozens. On Living Color. But again, that, that was just, uh, just a very hilarious skit, uh, just kind of a play essentially on uh, the, uh, the culture as a whole. And again, again, like I said, that whole the free, free verse mentality, um, being creative with it, you know, again, that kind of corporates dozens as well. But you even see the cultural differences, right? The, uh, your mama's so stupid she did low on the IQ says, even from the host. And so again, it's kind of, you know, interesting growing up in that, <laughs> um, talking to a guy, um, Man, I lived in five different homes before the age of 10. Uh, did pretty good in sports, went to private school, graduated from Indiana University. So it was just like a whole conglomerate of knowing this culture and knowing this culture and knowing how these cultures don't know each other. And so um, let me go ahead and get on to the next side. So um, what I was able to just kind of find and um, something that kind of com combines uh, the free verse, dozens, and coming back to what I ultimately love to do is uh, freestyling. Don't worry, I'm going to go ahead and kick off a little freestyle for you guys. But you're going to help me with that. Um, anybody familiar with 8 Mile? Okay. Stewart, MT, Tabitha? Familiar, haven't seen it. I will now, obviously, after <laughs> being confronted with it. Okay. All right. <laughs> so I, you know, and uh, I do uh, just kind of give a, a a warning. It's not PG. Uh, however, um, I, what I again wanted to again, I'm college graduate myself. You know, I, I like to look at the context and just kind of give you guys the context of this scene here. These are all folks that are working at a factory. Okay, and what Eminem was able to do f with this whole movie was to essentially tell his story, which is not too far off. You know, I got friends in Detroit, this, that, and the other, and, and that's just the culture. Again, the, the whole emphasis is to, um, again, to emphasize the free verse and the connection to the culture. And so you're talking about a whole culture of people during a time where, hey, I got to rap to get out of this mess. I got to do something to get out of this mess. So, I'm, you know, again, having... Again, me being a local MC, this, that, and other, I know when people are sitting up there writing down verses and this, that, and the other and battling, that is for real. And so again, this so happened, I mean, again, this is something we're talking about again, 
20 years ago. Uh, one of my favorite movies, this is one of my favorite scenes. Again, please party and he cursed it. Don't let your kids uh, <laughs> hear it, you know, because I'm still old school. Uh, tell them don't listen to this. So. Man, I'm getting so sick and tired of fucking with this field. They only give us 30 minutes to eat lunch and chill. My body aching just to get a buck. I'm sick of eating this shit off this fucking lunch truck. Nasty ass food. I'm in a nasty ass mood. I should have called in sick. Shit, I had something to do. I can't believe that I'm hearing all this raving and rain from Vanessa up here at the New Detroit Stampin'. You need to get your food and take your ass back to work. Right. You're dreaming if you think them corny ass raps are work. <laughs> Look at y'all standing out here freezing like dumb fucks, rapping and waiting for food off this raggedy lunch truck. Who want what? Who pumped up to get rolled up? I spit venom in every direction. Soak some up. Look at this fat ass nigga. <laughs> Sloppy sucker. You an ugly motherfucker. Your pop should have wore rubber. Stop rhyming. Keep your day job, Vanessa. Next time, leave that bullshit home on a dresser. Speaking of dresses, they go looking for all the fruitcake. <laughs> when you travel, you probably pack panties in your suitcase made out of lace from Victoria's Secret. If 10 men came in the cup, you probably drink it. Oh. <laughs> OK, folks, enough with the gay jokes, especially from a gay broke bitch yourself. Hey, Lo. <laughs> Just how I do do. You worked here longer than me, and I get paid more than you do. Dog, take a seat. What's this guy standing in line for? He ain't got money to eat. <laughs> check this out. Yo, yo. This guy cast his whole check and bought one homo. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking homo, little maggot. You can't hack it. Paul's gay. You're a faggot. At least he admits it. Don't even risk it. This guy's starving to death. Someone get him a biscuit. <laughs> I don't know what they told you, Mike. You must have them cornrows roll too tight. <laughs> His job, you want to quit, but you can't. You worked at this plant so long. You're a plant. <laughs> Look at your goddamn boots. <laughs> For Christ's sakes, they're starting to grow roots. <laughs> <laughs> On this mic, you get faded. You look like a pissed off rapper who never made it. Oh. <laughs> and why you fucking with the gay guy, G? When really you're the one who's got the HIV. Oh. Man, I'm done with this clown. It's soft. <laughs> Fuck it. I'll let homegirl finish you off. Guy <laughs> like you, I never get a real woman. All right. So, um, Stuart, you got a whole movie to watch. <laughs> to kind of understand it. Um, because again, that was just, you know, it was, it was just again so very telling. Um, then again, that's that's the culture. And again, I've stressed this the entire, really the whole presentation. Now I want to, um, again, want to take up that much time because I now want to get us in a place to where we can mirror some of what we saw. All right. Uh, are there any writers, are there poets in this? Uh, Zoom room tonight. MT, you write. Uh, but the, do y'all write, right? Are y'all what? What? What level of the, of the poetry game would you consider yourselves? Um, I definitely consider myself a novice. I try real hard, but <laughs> okay. Hey, man, I'm I'm still a novice myself. <laughs> um, Tabitha, what about you? Um. I play around. I wouldn't necessarily say I'm any good at it. <laughs> hey, it's all good. All right. So here we go, guys. First thing we, I want to do is do a little quick mic check. Mic check, mic check, one, two, one, two. This is Mr. Saunders, and he's coming through. Green eye bandit people don't understand it, and I feel like on the ground is someplace I've always landed. Face down to the ground. Boom is the only sound. Only thing I'm listening to the voices in my head and they sound so profound. Angels screaming and dreaming and giving me numbers. I'm always wondering every single summer. Why? When I begin to cry, do the tears fall down or am I upside down and they really are beginning to fly? I'm just beginning to try. And I'm 37 years old. And that's amazing that I'm that's now listening to what my grandmother once told me back in 93, when she actually said, 
you can be anything you want to be, but first, my son, you got to take that trash out. No talking back. No getting smart. Make sure that you love God and don't harden your heart. It's all about how you finish, but first you got to start. First, you got to remember that there's art in your heart. Mm. This is a freestyle. This is a freestyle. But as you can see, it's just talking about my testimony, talking about the people who've got me there. And I assure you that that same energy is in you all. Hey, I'm going to ask you guys to do two things for me. All right. Um, Anybody want a <laughs> free verse? What I mean by that, I said we got about, I know we kind of around an hour a little bit after that. I don't know what the time of saying is, but I know if this is, we can give some time to um, freestyle or free verse. When I say freestyle, that means you can go it off of off the cuffs and just talk about it. Free verse means, hey, let me just go ahead and write these words down real quick on what I'm thinking about, okay? You think you guys, and, and I'm and I'm MT to have the, you know, again, I started, this is essentially what I started doing was, okay, I'm love. Okay, that's simple. Democracy, okay, that gets a little interesting. Let me write about that. Um, let me just write the first things that I feel. Um, and then there's uh, who can write an I2 poem like Langston Hughes. And you, I, two of them there so that we can possibly mix it up um, if, you, you know, want to take that time just to write. Um, again, the I2 poem was essentially, um, again, we talk about the dozens and the, the culture of, um, I want to say insecurity, uh, the culture of those things in which you identify yourself being flawed. And Langston Hughes also did that with his free verse poem, I2, you know, with just the references of I being the darker brother who's, you know, sitting at the, at the table in, in, in the back room. And so again, uh, that I2 poem, you know, what would be your I2 poem? All right, guys, I hope you're doing okay. I was just kind of doing a little countdown and uh, just kind of, while you keep writing, but I just wanted to, something I always tell uh, audiences or just people, people that I'm in front of, just my feelings about poetry. Um, I think me and Richard, we probably had this conversation. I said, but I feel like Poetry is just very metaphysical. Um, I feel like you can speak things into existence. I feel like, say, because you're speaking of your culture, um, I'm one of those, the universe hears you. Um, and so I started this off talking about my father, right? And like, say, so he passed away August 12th. Um, this right here that's in front of you, uh, I don't know what I did with my computer screen, um, but this is a picture of my father <laughs> and it just kind of popped up. <laughs> um, and that's just interesting because again, this is kind of my way of healing um, as we're talking about poetry. Um, just and like I say, when I say I believe my father was a metaphysical person, wrote signs, symbols on his house and everything like that. Like I'm literally feeling like, yo, let me come, son, let me come see what y'all talking about over here. I heard you say my name at the beginning. What you talking about? <laughs> but it's like this the fact that this picture popped up. He didn't know, he never knew I took this picture. Um, I was just leaving his house, I believe on Father's Day and I took a picture just kind of him standing underneath the street light. Um, you know, um, and if, like for, for, you know, folks go back, remember that Coolio days, oh, uh, been living most of my life, living on the gangsters, you know, I don't know, it's just living life under the street light. I don't know. That's what that kind of reminds me of. But um, I just want to kind of, you know, point that out, man, that um, I really, and I can do better, but I just, I really think the world of poetry, I love the people that I've met, uh, the friends that I've made. Uh, through it, who have been vulnerable and bare. You know, the hard thing about it is even with poetry, you know, you meet a lot of people, you lose some people. Um, it, just, it, it, just, it, brings, it just brings a lot of people together. And uh, that's when I feel like that's the effort of it. Um, that's the magic of the free verse. Um, 
the, you know, the, the power and the responsibility of the voice. Um, because again, I, we, we really kind of, you know, even know um, a lot of people don't want to talk about Donald Trump and I didn't get it understandably so. But one of the things I've tried not to do is not because I, I really spent a whole lot of time trying to bash him. Not because of like two people having like, hey guys, lighten up, you know, I do what I want to do. I'm saying this for me. I so I got to observe this guy. One of the things I observe is, again, at the end of the day, people have to pay attention to his free verse. Why do, why do I say that? Because he was able to obviously reach people who felt like they weren't being heard, whether we agree with them or not. That still was uh, to the point where it was like, no, I can reach people. My, he's uh, he knows the whole communication of reality TV, the whole production of a show. He knows that saying the right thing, saying the wrong things, and still getting away with it because you know what I'm saying he really with his rhetoric, with his free verse, was able to, in my opinion, uh, document and expose us to a whole. Um, level of communication um you know that really kind of could, could, could that woke up danger and <laughs> you know and so um it's it's not to be ignored you know that that at some point in time like I said something went to where it's like hey this person's voice is like go to people man and um and so like I say it could, it could work it's still of that culture you know, so again, it's it's important to just really kind of recognize the power of, of that spoken word and the ability um, to communicate to people and what you're communicating to people and um, as it emphasizes the culture in which they're living in. And so um, be it poet or not, you know, one of the things I'm not a fan of, I'm not, a, I'm no longer a fan of small talk, never have been. I get tired of telling people I'm okay when I'm not okay. You know, uh, and so, you know, and that kind of happens a lot in work environments or just in passing, but it's just like, ugh, get tired of it, you know, because ultimately this feels like you're lying to yourself over and over and over again. And everyone else. And so it, to um, ladies' point about depression is it becomes easy to mask um, when, when you're not, and when you really don't know how to express yourself. Could be a fear for, not making someone mad, but like saying Trump's case, he did not care who he made mad. I just need to get my point across. And I wish more people was like that in terms of trying to do it for the right reasons. You know, so how are we coming along? We ready? I'm going, oh, all right, Pops, you can go ahead and come on down now. Real quick, one thing I wanted to throw in there just because, you know, you got, you know, definitely my gears turning on just some ideas too. Is just, I like what you said about, you know, just, that idea, of course, with, you know, dealing with depression, that idea of that mask. Um, and one great thing about writing is I feel like it's an unmasking process. Mm -hmm. You know, we reveal so much of ourselves as people in our writing and in the way we put words together. Yeah, that's, you know, it's, it's a very powerful tool, just like you were saying, like it, it can move people and sway people in powerful ways that you couldn't even imagine. Yeah, you know, and that's, you know, that's crazy because everybody, um, you know, Wonder Woman's gonna get like bad reviews. <laughs> and I'm just saying like, no, I'm, 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 I'm watching them like, man, this is scary to the mug. <laughs> Because I feel like people are in such a place, especially right now, in such a vulnerable place, that they'll just start wishing for the wrong stuff. And I feel like people have been wishing for the wrong stuff. Like that's that's what scared me the most. People are like thinking about monsters and fight scenes. I'm like, no, that that movie Wonder Woman was. <laughs> it was like dealing with the greatest fight that we have presently can see. I've not seen no big robots and machines and aliens and Thanos and all that. Yeah. <laughs> but what I have seen is people uh, stuck in evil ways. 
and able to, you know, manipulate the whole situation to where you can impact a whole lot of people, you know. So yeah, that 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 scared me. I ain't gonna lie. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely still gotta check that out for myself. Did we freeze again? No, I just, I just, I was just being still. <laughs> All right, anybody ready to share? I will. <laughs> I will. I, I just wrote whatever was coming off my mind. I was I wrote it. OK. Um, I write about things on my mind, how to go right when my life feels like it's going left. So many dreams, but how to get there. I will not stop even if it's not fair. I have to get this out of my head, out of my heart and climb the stairs to finally start. That's where I stopped. <laughs> okay and thank you for sharing that was really good yeah that's i mean it's real because it's like now now take that poem you, you know finish it or take it as it is and put it where you can see it because now you know now you begin to manifest that so you know because that's your that's your truth all right so anybody else uh, we're going down the line <laughs> I'm, look, I'm an MC, so we can get it. Next, we got coming to the mic tonight. At <laughs> We got coming to the mic. My son here, uh, his name is Asan. He's got a little poem for you tonight. Oh, yeah, I thought so. <laughs> All right, who we got? Stuart, Richard, who we got? MT, Tabitha, who, who, who got something for us? I guess I can go next here. All right, ladies and gentlemen, round of applause for Stuart Cotton, y'all. <laughs> I try to connect with everyone, but few try to connect with me. I help everyone with their vision, but few of them care for me to see. But somehow, their wanting me to find them helps me to want to find me. And that's key. My gift to you is what you already have. And my gift from you is that you are the. That's all I got. Okay, Stuart. <laughs> that was good. Yeah. That was good. Yeah. And so, like, I, I, I feel that you know, I feel that coming through. Like, say, so you, you was thinking about something. <laughs> you know, Half the people um, here know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Right. And and see, again, you know, you go around so long, again, it becomes, it's like you got to develop that, uh, that heart muscle, that feeling muscle. So it's just like, you know, I was like, and then I take away from it, it's just like, nah, I, again, the fluctuation of the voice, I think we kind of even learned that today, when, you know, listening to how Walt, Walt's poem was read, you know, the same monotone, you know, but still the words was an emphasis, but we, you know, Stuart, even I heard it go up and down. It's like, okay, there's a trigger there. You know what I'm saying? Like, nah. So, you know, again, you begin to practice and develop. Even that free was like, nah, they, they mean that. They mad. You know what I'm saying? That's, but then you can, whoo, You know? So, who we got next? MT, Tabitha, y'all got anything for us? Come on. <laughs> Here you go. <laughs> Just give us what you got. Oh, you got a little something on the tank? Yeah. I tried to like go off um, the, the telling my mother I have depression kind of vibe. Um, but yeah. <laughs> Grandma, I don't have a boyfriend. A conversation. I want to warn you about boys, she says. They'll rip your heart out. But 
what will happen to your heart when I tell you? Will it remain beating or will it leap out of your chest helplessly flailing on the floor like a fish out of water? She says, boys will play with you. I played with you, creating this perfect grandchild, the kid of your dreams, but boys will make you happy, grandma says. But I'm not happy. I'm trapped in these expectations you hold for me. for me, I'm broken, and I'm tired of pretending to be someone who isn't me. Yeah, that's all I've got. That's all? You say that like that wasn't amazing. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if you saw me, but I'm, I'm like... I have, like, so many topics that I want to write about, but I'm too scared to, and I finally, like, was like, hey, I can do this, and it's... I don't know. I have a lot of high expectations for myself, and I felt like I didn't. Maya, just write. Just keep writing. Right. And, and so I say this, and I'm going to tell you like uh, someone told me. When I say poetry is metaphysical, <clears throat> Mari Evans once wrote, um, and if you go downtown Indianapolis, you'll see a mural of her on Mass Ave. Um, when I die, I know I'll have a big funeral. Curiosity seekers coming to see if I'm really dead or just trying to cause trouble. Mari Evans wrote that poem years ago, 60s maybe. I read that poem in the uh, mid 90s, seventh, eighth grade. Here I am actually talking to her in 2016, 2015, uh, not 20, yeah, having lunch with her. This poem, this woman's poem who I read as a boy. Now here's the kicker. She sits me down and I'm thinking, I asked her, here I am. This, this is a poet that Oprah reveres. This is a poet that Maya Angelou says is the best, one of the best poets. And I'm sitting down in front of her like I'm sitting in front of you. And I'm thinking, I'm saying, okay, what can I ask her? What, what can you tell me to do as a poet? Two words. Keep writing. And I'm like, keep writing. I recorded her telling her me that. Keep writing. Because when she passed away, here I am at a funeral that she wrote about years ago. And so actually being in this place, you know what I'm saying? Like when I'm, I'm going to her funeral, right? And I'm remembering this poem that she wrote. And as I'm walking to the door, opening the door, I'm like, and I hear this poem, when I die, I'm sure I have a big funeral. And I look in, I was like, man, it's a big funeral. Curiosity seekers come to see if I'm really dead. And I'm coming, I'm kind of see really dead because I never saw her in the casket. I was there late. Are just trying to cause trouble, you know? And so I remember John Lewis telling me, I met him too. It was like, you know, you got to, like that whole, you got to start trouble. That's what he means. So, all right. Uh, Tabitha, you got anything for us? MT, that was beautiful, by the way. And like I said, that, that, that really brought, I think it brought us into your story. Like, you guys are doing great. Next, we got Tabitha Pierce coming to the mic. Can't give it up. Uh, I got a little something, but whenever I get, I don't know how much free versa is because I kind of started going and writing about my kids, and then it kind of became like a conversational. Back. Go for it. Go for it. I don't know. it. Still counts as free versa. <laughs> okay. Hey, 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 mom, mom. Mom, look, look, look. That's cool. Good job. You're so sweet. But let me do this first. I got to finish this paper. I'm in a meeting, girls. <laughs> girls, come here. Help me pick up. Dressed right now. But we're busy. Let me do this first. I'm playing. Let me finish. I have stuff to do, too. That's the kid. <laughs> Is that the kid? <laughs> oh my god! Yeah, she was <laughs> like, "Are you talking to me?" I said, "No, I'm talking about, <laughs> I'm talking about you." <laughs> oh, it's like I'm. <laughs> it's like that's that's man. See, you could, we could make that up. You know what I'm saying? For it to happen this the way that that happened, like so again that for that truth to actually pour through like i can't even have i can't even get on a poetry set virtual poetry set write about my kids without my kids saying who you writing about 
<laughs> you. That's 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 beautiful. Man. I love that. I love that because my kid, my son, literally came over here. My daughter comes over here because they watch me do these things on Zoom, and so my daughter's like, "Yo, I can MC too." Cause you my deity, and if my deity can do it, then I can do it. So, what you got for us, Richard? I got a little something. Um, just a little something. Definitely free verse. Um, you know, one thing I want to say though, you know, before I go into this, definitely with uh, just a uh, little blanket thing. Those were wonderful poems. Thank you for sharing those with us. You know, one hundred percent. And the only thing I can really say as far as writing goes, because, hey, this is an area where very few can ever call themselves a master. You know, it's, you're always learning something. But I've always had that belief that it's like, you know, you'll never be a bad writer if you keep asking how you can do better, how you can improve, how you can innovate, how you can see differently, you know. If you never stop thinking differently, seeing different ways, learning, educating yourself. You'll never be a bad writer. You know, you're just becoming more of your own writer. And that's it. So, but I got a little something. Um, it's a work in progress. <laughs> uh, ta -ta -ta. There comes a time in a black man's life where he must acknowledge his own privilege must constantly question his perceptions, stay practicing introspection, no protection, because it's got to be raw. When he asks himself, is he even worthy to speak of some of this oppression when his community declares secession for the unholy transgression of speaking in a colonized tongue? This body be brown, but still too white. Yo, yo, Ebonics, a little rough boy. See, I know you ain't from the hood, but you stay talking about violence against it like you about that life. Yeah, you got that right. See, you just too white to be about this life. So why you talking about it? That's about as far as I got on this one. You play too much, Mr. Bowman. Just a little <laughs> bit. <laughs> man, look, I'm, I'm here, man. Like, come on, come on. <laughs> Oh my God, I I have, man, you guys all, like I said, all of this is, that's just incredible. Um, I hope that I was just able to provide some, just some context um, for free verse for you guys. I'm glad we was able to just kind of arrive to this point where you just got a little, little bit of new knowledge about it, but at the same time, some new knowledge to which you feel like it can be applied. And that's the whole point, you know, just kind of putting essentially what you did uh, tonight, just in writing something um, in context of the, the 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 history of it, the might of it, the, the the different forms of it, that again there is no there, there's nothing holding you back. It, it, again, it's just it's honoring. It's that's essentially a part of it. Naturalness, just to be natural, you know, to be who you naturally are. No poem was the same. There was no red, red roses, red, violet, the blue. There was none of that. There was everyone at their authentic self. And that's just, a, I think that's very important as we kind of go, you know, as we go forward. Um, that's my presentation for you guys, but I would love to leave you guys with a poem. Um, just so y'all, if, if, if y'all can see if I'm really about that. <laughs> and I really want to be more about that. So, is that all right? All right. Go for it. Um, like I said, the only way I'm going to present this poem is if everybody put their cameras up. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. <laughs> Good to see you. Good to see you as well. All right. Um, Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Eric Saunders, and I come, I'm sorry, <clears throat> my name is Mr. Saunders, and I come bearing gifts. No, not presents or gifts you find under your Christmas tree, but more so when your gifts within become more present. And you find yourself on the other side of learned lessons with your present gifts. You better put your heart into it because it will be hardly fluid if it's barely stewarded. You got to create and don't hesitate. Let I am live your life. Now let that resonate. Aim for stars bar with your fate with our present gifts. We take cause. Now let the force regulate. I know my father and wonder under the clean black nights remembering the cause of the big homie nate because nobody does it better they can come closer than close but original day never will be ready 
take no prisoners as a position where your focus begins to concentrate and when your heart beats a little faster and everything before you cause you master, that's the place. Trust me. I'm not talking about a pay for a piece of paper and no reverence to race, but when purpose meets you on the path and begins to laugh and says, keep up before we take stride, see? It won't take long before you make a word riddle and divide. Be surprised when they see just how eloquently the fire shines from your eyes. Watch how everyone will rise up in place. This is the place where we are remastered by the master of life and not just life itself, but from whom life gets its help. Shares this Kung Fu of going forward. The fundamentals of these moves transforms you into the mind of Morpheus, but this is no movie where we can just press fast forward. Life don't move a little faster. Just with more precision, the closer we listen to the discipline of wisdom, seeking to remold those chose to be nothing more than urbanized bastards. That's not a mess in front of you. That's purpose to the mess in front of you with these present gifts. I must remind you of this. Just because you say you have faith does not mean you're walking towards where you're called even if it's unseen. See, we kicking down many powerful doors, so kicks must be fast and quick like Street Fighter's Chung Lee because children are art and are smart and know the deal for real. How dare we tell the kids to live their dream when we've not lived our very own? or at least tempted greater range. I know things happen in tragedy intertwines and vibrations and lines are beyond our control. But now is this time to console all the handful of no's that was painfully imposed into our souls. Look around you and see we are still standing here in spite of all the trauma we've seen unfold. Muhammad Ali, rest in peace. But it seems folks still have not learned the sacrifice and tactic of rope and dope that folks will take you out and leave you broke when you stand up right for freedom's hope, but this is not about the right, the boat, but to see we are one with eternity, with ancient dragons seeking to find their fire and the breath of the oppressed, and we are face down, deep, drowning in water, dipped in and out, longer and faster by anything that is oppressive, declaring itself your master, and just when your head spins, throwing in a towel appears to be the only option. Your present gifts begin to take lift, and you remember just what you've been taught when walking along your path, and as you feel yourself drifting fast, you remember when Purpose looked at you and laughed. It says, get by my side and never look back. No need to wallow and spread wrath when it gets bad. This is where we calculate our attacks and understand that this is the reason you needed to learn math. As you multiply your potential then divide it by 360 dimensions and then begin to listen within a suspension that only stars like the sun recognize. But don't be so surprised. If my body begins to rise up out of the water, free from a food master's hands, up against the eyes, looks you square into their eyes, who's the master? With teeth catching bullets and mighty hands catching fists, you tell them this, I am. But God, in present gifts, live in the love for yourself and begin to show. And the radiance of your shine defied the eyes and begins to glow. And the universe welcomes you to the place you've been trying to find. But ironically, you already know it's your time to shine. But if you only do what you can do, it'll never be more than what you are now. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much, Eric. I uh, really you. enjoyed your presentation today. Um, yes, just, thank you. Appreciate that. <laughs> I really do. It's it's been a journey to get to this presentation. We've been talking about this for months. <laughs> yeah. It's so, really helpful. So, um, yeah. but I'm, even though this is our last session, we do plan on trying to do this again. Um, we will get back with you and let you know dates as soon as we get something worked out. Um, but we would love to have you back, wouldn't we, Richard? <laughs> definitely. We definitely love to have you back again. I'll, I'll ride up to Muncie, go grab me some Pizza King and Carl Cannons. And, oh, wow. <laughs> uh, you know what I'm saying? Okay. I got married, I got married in Muncie, so yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. I'm not saying that like it's the Bahamas or something like that. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. like you got a resort in Muncie and everything else. <laughs> Well, uh, just uh, I just want to thank everybody for coming. Um, just a reminder of the Poetry Slam. Please sign up, or if you know somebody that want to sign up, have them sign up, because um, we really would like to have anybody showcase their talent. We just want, want it out there. We are putting these videos on YouTube, but we want people to see that there's talent all around, that, that poetry can be life-changing. Um, 
I know in this series, I have learned a lot when it comes to poetry. I used to write when I was younger and I stopped and somehow it's coming back and, and I am enjoying it. So, um, welcome back. back to so, so just, uh, we, I just want to thank you all for coming. Um, Richard, do you have anything to say with this being our last session this time? Uh, well, with this being our last session, ultimately, I would just love to say just thank, you know, everybody for being involved. Thank you for being a part, you know, just uh, coming into the space. Uh, you know, I, I hope you really enjoyed the other workshops if you got to catch those. And I hope you look forward to more and bring more people in with you. And definitely sign up for the the slam slash, you know, showcase. Definitely sign up for it, you know, contact you know, myself and Tanisha will get you on the list. We'll, you know, we're really looking forward to it. And most importantly, everyone keep writing. Yes. No matter what it, what it looks like or how it feels, just keep writing. Maya, you keep writing. Never give up. Tabitha, you too. Everyone in here. Um, thank you all for coming. And I want to end this. I don't want to end it, but I have to. <laughs> so. That's, that's awesome. fun. You know what I'm saying? That's. Like I said, I can find some more stuff to dig up. <laughs> you want to just end it like your mama jokes or? No. <laughs> Eric, you're welcome to come to um, the Poetry Slam and participate in a talent showcase. I, I would love to have you come back and hear some more of your poetry. No problem. Okay. Just let me know, man. Okay. Definitely. I'll get you the info. Okay. Well, thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody.